His Excellency Harry Heinz Schwartz, Ambassador of South Africa to the United States, spoke before the Council on November 6, 1991 at the Baltimore Grand. Ambassador Schwartz's address is entitled, Freedom is Not Complete if it is Exercised in Poverty. Introducing the speaker is Mr. Charles W. Cole, Jr., President of First National Bank of Maryland and Co-Chair, Board of Trustees, the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. I'm Charles Cole, co-chairman of the council, and my colleague sitting down in the front row, Sheila Riggs, is the other uh, co-person. Um, Dr. Frank Bird, our distinguished president, of, is of course with us tonight, and he will conduct later on the question and answer period. As a personal note, I spent all morning working on strategic direction at my principal place of employment for our international division, and then all afternoon, sitting in on a panel uh, where the discussions was taking place on consolidation of two of the universities of Maryland's principal uh, colleges. In other words, a domestic challenge. And then this evening, of course, we're back in the international area. So it's a day of going kind of full, full circle. The last time we were together, the Vice President of the United States uh, was here. It was certainly a wonderful turnout. It was a unique experience for the, for the council. And tonight we are continuing with that same quality theme. Our distinguished uh, speaker tonight is an outstanding individual, so to be certain that I don't miss uh, any of his background, let me uh, proceed to, uh, to read, read uh, the background to you. Our distinguished speaker is a truly remarkable man of courage and principle, Ambassador Harry Heinz Swartz, the South African ambassador to the United States. The fact that the Ambassador Swartz holds such an important post in his government is a testimony to the profound changes sweeping South Africa today. A veteran member of the anti-apartheid opposition in the South African Parliament, he was at the time of his ambassadorial appointment a member of the Parliament, a Democratic Party spokesman on finance, and de deputy chairman of the Parliament Standing Committee on Finance. For many years, Mr. Swartz has been a strong advocate of human rights for all South Africans and for negotiations to formulate a new democratic constitution. Ambassador Swartz emigrated to South Africa with his parents, Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany. His distinguished public career began in 1951 when he was elected to the Johannesburg City Council. It's a beautiful city, I've been there. He held, he held several posts in the United Party, and in 1975 led a breakaway group which became the nucleus of the Reform Party. Mr. Swartz was later a founding member of the Democratic Party, which was formed by reformers from across South Africa. Today, despite his governmental post, he retains his membership in the Democratic Party. A lawyer by profession, he holds the order of materials service which is awarded to South Africans who have rendered exceptional service. Ambassador Swartz shares President de Klerk's view that the dismantling of apartheid is irreversible and accepted his current post only after receiving assurances that the South African government is sincerely committed to full democracy and power sharing. He has been an unwavering proponent of a market economy and has pressed his views in public debates with other leaders in South Africa. We look forward to hearing Ambassador Schwartz's views on the future of South Africa, his unique perspective on the exceptional changes taking place there, and the implications for the rest of the world. Please join me in welcoming the Ambassador. The podium is yours, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that after that introduction, the safest thing that I could do would be to go back to Washington and say nothing at all, uh, because perhaps uh, I might spoil it all. Uh, I must, can you not hear? Right. Uh, can you hear me now? Right. Uh, you know, I don't quite understand what happens to me in Baltimore, and uh, I've been in the United States for about eight months. 
and I have only had two pickets or demonstrations, and they've both been in Baltimore when I've come here. <laughs> Nowhere else in the United States does anybody picket me. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, when I came here this evening, uh, the demonstrators were outside, and you could look at their posters, and they were very similar to the ones when I was here last time, in which they, for instance, say, down with apartheid. My difficulty is that I've been saying down with apartheid long before they discovered the word apartheid as far as the people outside are concerned. And I find these demonstrations quite fascinating. Uh, this evening was perhaps a little more fascinating than most because uh, I went to each one of the demonstrators, I introduced myself, I shook hands with them, and the one gentleman proceeded to thank me because he had had a problem in South Africa, and even though he was demonstrating against me, he had been in touch with me, he'd asked me to deal with one of the ANC activists in South Africa that he was worried about, and that he was concerned about, and that he hadn't been able to get any answer from his own people for very many months. So the South African ambassador provided him with a service, as a result of which he decided to come and demonstrate against him, but at the same time to thank him. But you see, maybe uh, my, this, this sort of thing about uh, Baltimore has got a longer history than just the, the events that are taking place now, because uh, when I've been not in Baltimore, but in a Baltimore, I've also had people shooting at me and trying to knock me to the ground, because it may interest you to know that in the Second World War, I flew 72 sorties in an aircraft called the Baltimore, which was manufactured and made just down the road here by, I think it's the Martin Company, which I think now has a slightly different name. And uh, I must tell you that uh, you bear in mind that having been in that Baltimore, having had the Germans try and knock me down, you will appreciate that being in Baltimore tonight, a few demonstrators are sure not going to knock me down. Uh, I also find it uh, fascinating that your um, previous speaker here was Vice President Quell. Uh, I obviously can't match him in any way, nor will I try to do so, except to tell you that he's my neighbor. He lives, I live across the road from him, and uh, I have pointed out to him that I know exactly when he comes home at night because there are sirens that wake me at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there's a helicopter that flies over my house. So I have a very close connection with Vice President Quayle, uh, if only for the noise that he makes when he comes home. Uh, and perhaps that's why you chose me to follow him here, as I have this connection with him in that regard. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, the topic that's been given to me tonight is uh, freedom is incomplete if it's exercised in poverty. And you know, throughout most parts of the world, the cry today is in fact for democratization. And such words have been turned into action in very many countries. Everyone talks of democracy, some people practice democracy, and of course different people have different meaning to the term democracy. And today, very often, people think democracy, and certainly in the case of the people outside, and very many people inside my own country, take the view that democracy, all that it means, is that you have the vote. But the problem is that there is much more to democracy than the vote. Sure, the vote is essential. But true democracy is not merely that you go every so often, every so many years, and either put your cross next to somebody's name or press some computer button which uh, signals that you support a person who most of the time you don't even know, whom you've never seen, except perhaps in pictures. There's much more to it than voting in that context. What in fact democracy also means is that in fact you must have rights and must rights have rights which are protected. It means you've got freedom of speech. It means you've got freedom of religion. You've got freedom of assembly. 
You've got all these things which you yourselves have in your constitution. And you see, what some of us are trying to do in South Africa is to create for our own people nothing more, nothing less than what you have got as American citizens. And I think that's not asking to achieve any particular situation. And you know, the truth is that you yourselves are critical of your constitution. You're critical of the delays. You're critical of the fact that it creates problems and some people seek to abuse it. But the reality is that it has stood the test of time and it has given protection to people over years and years. Now what we have to do in South Africa, we've got to create a new constitution, not a constitution for which anybody is giving us any length of time to do, but suddenly everything has got to move and has got to move fast. Since President Leclerc came to office, it's only a very short while ago, February 1990, and he has during that period achieved much more in regard to change in South Africa with a minimum degree of violence and disruption. Unfortunately, some of it hasn't been able to be avoided. It has happened much as we have not wanted it to happen. But he's achieved all those changes in that period of time, so much so that even the most severest critics will admit when you talk to them that they never expected to see so much change within so short a period of time. And that has been achieved, has been achieved because people in South Africa have now got a different mindset to the problem. They realize with the process of democratization throughout the world, they realize that an unjust system cannot continue forever. And they realize that you have to sit down at a table in order to see that you solve the problems on a pe in a peaceful manner. But that does not mean that the whites in South Africa, for example, should be without rights. They must be without privilege, but they must not be without rights. Because in the same way as no other South African, whether black or, or colored or Indian, as we have them in South Africa, as the terms are called, should not be without rights. No human being should be without rights, and those rights need to be protected. But you see, and this comes to the theme of, of what my particular topic is tonight. Does it really help you if they have the franchise? If in fact you have no job, if you have no house, if you have no proper education for your children? The reality is, that the issue of voting starts taking place when you yourself are a deprived person. If you are without a home, if you are without a job, then the franchise doesn't have the meaning that it should have. Certainly, freedom is important. Freedom is fundamental. It's what people fight for, what people have died for. But at the same time, freedom, as I've tried to put in the topic here, is incomplete if you exercise it in poverty. And the greatest challenge to South Africa is not the ability to write a constitution. We can write a constitution. It's not that difficult. And in fact, there are many things in common which the parties have where they will be able to find each other quite easily. Let me give you some examples agree that there should be a universal franchise, that everybody should have the vote. We all agree that there should, in fact, be a Bill of Rights. We all agree that there should be an entrenched constitution. What we don't agree on is the nature of the constitution. Some people want, like myself, a federal constitution, such as you have in the United States. Other people want a unitary constitution, such as exists in Great Britain. We're going to come to terms on it. It's not that difficult to come to terms in relation to these things to work out a constitution. You yourselves have a history in terms of which it wasn't so easy to draw a constitution. You had great difficulty, but eventually you virtually and unanimously adopted a constitution and you've had relatively few changes to it for a long period of time. 
But when it comes to the economy, it's a different story. And let me just give you a couple of facts relating to our, the state of our economy. At the present moment, we have 42% of our workforce unemployed. 42%. Think of your own unemployment figure and compare it with ours. We have an inflation rate of 15%. We have our economic growth has disappeared. Last year, we had a minus 1% situation in regard to the GDP. And if you compare the gross domestic product of a country with a loaf of bread, that loaf of bread became smaller while our population increased by 2.8% so that there were more people who had a share in that loaf of bread. That's our economic situation. I can quote you many more statistics. Unemployment, we have uh, our workforce increasing by 400,000 people a year. That's just the workforce. And of those, only 50,000 are finding jobs. 350,000 are added to the pool of the unemployed. These are recipes for very serious problems. In addition, you've got to realize that there are tremendous expectations in our country. People have been deprived, unjustly deprived, discriminated against, see in the vote, see in the change towards a democracy, an answer not only to the removal of that discrimination, but they see a possibility, a real possibility and a demand for a change in the economic plight. We have a need at the present moment of our, in our population, which is 40 million people, for something like 2 million houses which need to be provided. And around our cities, people are living in shanties and shacks because there's inadequate housing. Now, people who look towards political power as an answer to the economic problems, have expectations which, if they are not fulfilled, create serious problems for a new democracy. And one of the messages that I've tried to put across is that if, in fact, you believe that there should be a democracy in South Africa, then one must give that democracy a chance of survival. Because if the new democracy cannot deliver to its people what is expected from them, then you will find that democracy in jeopardy. And I said to someone, said to some people this afternoon, that this is not very dissimilar to Eastern Europe, where there are tremendous expectations from the change from a command economy to, in fact, a free market economy. People have tremendous expectations that everything is going to be marvelous overnight. But you know, that life is not like that. On the contrary, the road from Slavery in Egypt, as the Bible tells us, to the promised land took 40 years and it was full of troubles and trials and tribulations. And on the way, people became despondent. And you may be familiar with the story of the children of Israel coming to the Red Sea. And when they were pursued by Pharaoh and were hungry, they said, why did you take us away from slavery? At least we had food, at least we were able to exist. And then freedom ceased to be meaningless to them because they were worried about their physical safety, about their own well-being. And that's the story of political change. And that's the story that in fact relates to South Africa. If those expectations cannot be met, then we will jeopardize the democracy that will then have been fought for and will have been achieved. And there you have another problem which exists. And that is that, strange enough, when all over the world communist parties are closing down, in our country suddenly the communist party has been started just at this moment of time again. And it flourishes. I've got its manifest in my papers. And it advocates doctrines which will certainly lead us into another period of ruin. And you see, the difficulty is that when you go to people who are deprived, to people who haven't got jobs, who people are hungry, whose children haven't received proper schooling, and haven't got proper shelter, 
and you offer them an alternative economic doctrine, they do not know that it has failed elsewhere in the world. And they are, in fact, able to be persuaded to follow that kind of doctrine. So one of the things that we've got to do in South Africa is we've not only got to rebuild the economy, but we've also got to have a debate about what is the correct economic policy to follow. What philosophy should be followed? What, in fact, should be the kind of economic engineering that we indulge in? All of this is a challenge, in fact, to our country as to what needs to be done. And you see, that's where the theme comes in. Freedom isn't complete when it's exercised in poverty because, in fact, freedom and democracy are jeopardized when people are living in poverty because then they turn to alternative doctrines, they turn to quick fixes, they turn to the wrong policies, and they become gullible to the promises of politicians. And I know all about promises of politicians. I was one for 40 years. That's what life is about, and this is what the problem is. But you see, in fact, South Africa can put it all right, because we have the resources. South Africa is a country which is well endowed with natural resources, but it has the problem which the rest of Africa has, and that is that it exports its commodities without adding value to it, without beneficiating the commodities. It exports them elsewhere to the industrialized world, and then it buys it back at a higher price. We, in fact, have the capacity in South Africa to change that. We have both the resources and we have the sophistication in our industry to, in fact, create these jobs. We have the ability to do so. We've got the expertise. We've got the best transport system in Africa. We have the best power grid in Africa. We can provide a lead for Africa, not only for ourselves. But you see what's happened to us is that we've had a not only apartheid, which has been a scourge on our country, but then, having had the scourge, we had another scourge which punished us again, and that was sanctions which took place. And you know, it's an interesting situation. The one sanction that took effect against South Africa was the sanction by the banks, which deprived us of international capital. And it turned us from a country which had to have capital to grow, a country that had to export capital. We had a debt standstill. We had to pay our debts. And we've got a good record in regard to our creditworthiness, as a result of which we lost every year since 1985 two and a half percent of our gross domestic product. The total of our debt repayment per year was 2.5% of our gross domestic product. The money which we borrowed before 1985 amounted to just over 2% of the gross domestic product. So you realize that when last year we had a minus 1% position in regard to the gross domestic product, you can see where it went. And if we want to revive our economy, the problem is that the moment we revive an economy such as ours, imports go up, and you then find yourself in a current account deficit. In other words, your exports are less than your imports as your economy revives. And if you cannot get money from the capital account, in other words, if you cannot borrow money from the banks abroad, then you can't meet that deficit and you go bankrupt. So the result is that we've had to keep our current account in surplus. We've had to dampen down the economy. We've had to stop growth in the economy. And that's where the unemployment has come. And the unemployment has come amongst the ranks of the people who least deserve it. It's been the unemployment amongst the victims, not amongst those who've had the benefits of apartheid. Because the unemployment hasn't been amongst the whites. The unemployment has been amongst the blacks in South Africa. So now we face a situation where we are about to start negotiations. We are about to write a new constitution. We've got to get our economy right. And yet we can't allow our economy to grow because of the absence of access to adequate foreign capital. 
If we get access to foreign capital, we can get a growth rate of 5 and 6 percent, and that will help to solve our problems. It will help to assist with the question of the redistribution aspect, which is a matter which is a very high profile and contentious issue in South Africa. It will help to create the jobs which we need. It will do the things which are required. So you see, the answers are there for us. We can become a powerful nation. We can become an industrial hub for the rest of Africa. We can provide the things which Africa in the sub-Saharan region so desperately needs once our politics becomes right. But we have to be given the opportunity to do it, and it can't be done overnight. You don't create a job instantly. Not like taking some instant coffee and pouring water over it and you've got a job. Before anybody invests money, they investigate. They come with their notebooks, as we say, and there's a long gap between coming with a notebook and coming with a checkbook and then coming and building a factory and creating a job. It takes years. So if we find a situation that we actually have a democratic government and we haven't yet dealt with some of the economic problems, then, as I indicated to you earlier, we will find the difficulty of that democratic government being under pressure. Protesters outside had asked uh, Lane Burke if she would ask the ambassador on their behalf uh, why he was asking the United States for financial help when indeed the uh, problem, political problems of apartheid had not been fully met. And uh, uh, Lane Burke remarked, of course, that was the major theme of the ambassador's comments and that she would uh, share that with the uh, protesters. Could I just add uh, a few words to it? Firstly, uh, I have not asked you tonight, and I think you will agree, to invest in apartheid. I've asked you to invest in the new South Africa, in the new democratic South Africa. Anybody who makes an investment decision today will probably find that that will not be implemented until such time as there is a new South Africa, until there is, in fact, a democratic country. If you're going to build a factory, it will take you two, three years, by which time we will have a constitution in place, and the negotiations are going to start, in fact, very soon. I concede that nobody has, that the, it's correct that black people do not have the vote at the moment. Uh, I can also tell you that the, gov the present government is prepared to give them a vote, but they don't want it from the government. They want it as a result of negotiations to achieve it themselves. It's one of the most misunderstood things in, South in the United States. There is no such thing as the government giving the vote to black people. Black people want to achieve that themselves, and I think they're right. I think that to give legitimacy, in order to give pride to yourself, you want to achieve a thing to yourself, you don't want it given to you. And I agree with them completely that what has to happen is that they have to be party to achieving that for themselves. And I think that's really where I think the misunderstanding in relation to the vote often arises. And I'm therefore pleased that even though I answered your question, I had a chance of just adding a little postscript to it. Yes, here in the center and then at the microphone. Yes, sir. The question was, have the sanctions, in fact, changed government policy in South Africa? The answer to that is actually no, and I'll tell you why. Sanctions have hurt South Africa. They've hurt the wrong people. I've demonstrated to you how the financial sanctions, which are the most effective ones, in fact have helped to create not all of the unemployment, but certainly some of the unemployment that exists. What has happened in South Africa? and I think that needs to be un, uh, perhaps stated, is that firstly, we were lucky that at the right time, the right man came who showed the right courage in order to take the steps which were needed. But it, one must also understand that there was a process of democratization throughout the world. That process is virtually irresistible and it has affected South Africa as much as any other country. Take what's just happened in Zambia which is, a, to my mind, one of the most exciting things that's happened in, in, in Africa for a long time, that you've had a democratic election without intimidation, without problems, a change of government without a revolution. It is really 
part of this whole atmosphere of democratization. I think also what has to be borne in mind is that there was a view taken by the president that it is better to negotiate now than to seek to hold a situation as Smith tried to do in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, until such time as you've got no negotiating power at all. And lastly, I think, one of the things which is very important, and perhaps the most important, is that I think one mustn't take away from the black people of South Africa themselves the effort that they've made towards their own liberation. In other words, the effort of the black people of South Africa in their struggle is also perhaps the most major aspect of the whole process of change. I don't say that sanctions had no effect on South Africa. Certainly they did. But the reality is that the process of change is not what was caused by sanctions. It was caused by the other factors which arose and which I've tried to outline. Yes, sir. At the microphone on the left. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask an economic question. Is it easy to start a business in South Africa? And in particular, can a black start a small business in South Africa? The uh, question was, can indeed a is it easy to start a small business in uh, South Africa? For example, can a black start a business there easily? Yes, it is easy to start a business in South Africa. It wasn't always easy. Uh, at one stage, our uh, economy was entwined in red tape, that before you could start a business, you had to get innumerable consents and permissions, and you name it, uh, every obstacle was placed in its way. Secondly, in South Africa, there were laws uh, which at one stage restricted blacks from carrying out business wherever they wanted to carry out. That is no longer the situation. You may own property where you like. You may conduct business where you like. The rules in regard to the conduct of businesses are subject today to very limited rules, which are the ordinary rules that apply in any country to hygiene and matters of that sort, where they're appropriate, and workers' safety where it's necessary. Those sort of rules apply, but for the rest, there are no difficulties. There are also, there's in existence a small business development corporation, which is there to assist ordinary people, little guys, ordinary guys to start businesses. Uh, and the term guy includes, what's the American for female guy? I don't know. What's a female guy? Girl. <laughs> right. uh, it assists everybody in order to uh, start businesses, and it's, in fact, very easy. One of the interesting things about South Africa at the moment is that some 8% of our gross domestic product is estimated now to be coming from what is called the informal sector, where people just start businesses without permission, without consent, without anything, but just get uh, start a business in their backyard or in the street or on an open lot or somewhere, and some 8% of uh, economic activity is, is in fact derived from that. But if you want to start a formal business in South Africa today, it is actually easier than it is on my information in the, than it is in the United States. Would you comment on the charge that uh, is made by leaders of the current strike that uh, the current government is building into the future constitution and laws of South Africa uh, a de facto way of continuing, if not apartheid formally, at least uh, uh, something which approximates it. Well, let me t uh, tell you that that isn't so. The strike is about two things. The first is, and I brought some of the copies of the pamphlets which have been issued um, with me, uh, the government decided some years ago after extensive investigation, after every opportunity to make representations, after invitations to people to sit on committees right across the, com the community to introduce a value-added tax, which is uh, as opposed to the general sales tax which we had. The difference, I don't know how much you're aware of uh, the difference between value-added tax and general sales tax, uh, but the difference is that a general sales tax is only added at the end. In other words, when you go into a shop and buy something, they add it on. Whereas in a value-added tax, you add the tax at every stage of production or at every sale that's intermediate, and you get a credit for the tax that's been paid, so that it actually prevents 
abuse in relation to uh, the whole tax system because it's almost a self-policing system. And the effect of it is that you actually pay a lower rate of tax in the end in total because at the end of the road you're paying, in this case, 10% tax as opposed to the 13%. And you don't pay 10% at every stage because you get a credit for what's been paid. So the cumulative total is actually only 10% in any case at the end. And the objection is to that tax, not in itself, but because the tax is being imposed upon certain items which they regard should not be taxed. And the uh, examples which are given in the pamphlet are, for example, uh, certain foodstuffs. Some basic foodstuffs are zero rated. Zero rated means you pay no tax right the way through. Uh, such as, for example, maize meal in South Africa, which is a basic food, is zero rated, so there's no value added tax on it at all. But some other foods have got the tax on it. The principle being that if you have a tax which is universally applied, it has less administration involved, and it means that the tax rate can remain lower. There's also an objection, for example, to payment of tax on electricity, uh, which has not been the case until now. So the objection has been uh, to the concept of imposing this tax on certain items which are included in the value added tax system. And that's set out in the pamphlets. Anybody who'd like to see them can have a look at them uh, later, and I brought them along for this very purpose. But there is a more important issue on which they uh, have held a strike. And that is that they said that the government should not make major decisions without consulting the extra parliamentary organizations. In other words, that they said, we want to be consulted. Now, this is part, and I think one must understand it, this is part of what the negotiating process is about. Because in the negotiating process, mass action, such as the strike which has taken place, is one of the weapons which is being used in the negotiating process in order to give people leverage. And this is the argument which, in fact, has been advanced. It has not been advanced that this is uh, a trick in order to preserve, say, white supremacy. That argument hasn't even been advanced to the people uh, in the pamphlets or in the speeches. That's an argument that we've heard here from people who've advocated it in a completely different form and have distorted what even the case is which is made out in South Africa. There's been a strike for two days. Uh, very many people stayed away. I think from the organizer's point of view, it was a successful strike. But bear in mind, Bear in mind that those two days away from work by the people who did work and who have got work has actually cost us, if you work it out, both in wages loss, in production loss, in the whole sum total of it, again, about approximately 2% of a, 2 of a percentage point in the gross domestic product. So every time you do this, you actually make the task of reconstruction a little more difficult. But at the same time, I want to tell you, I can understand people wanting to use their muscle in order to demonstrate that you must consult us, you must deal with us, and use this as part of a process in what is taking place in regard to the negotiations. So whereas I don't like the strike, I think the strike has cost us economically what we can't afford. But I think one has to see it in the correct context as to what its objective was and that nobody is suggesting that this is actually an endeavor to preserve white supremacy by some indirect means. I must tell you, if, if VAT, would have, if the value-added tax would have been introduced five years ago, nobody would have said a word. If it were introduced in five years' time after a democratic government is in, introduced in, in power, there wouldn't have been a, a complaint because, in fact, it's a very efficient tax as opposed to an ordinary sales tax. And, in fact, it is imposed in some of the states in the United States. It exists in the whole of the common market in Europe. It is universally accepted as a correct means and a fair means of taxation. Yes, sir. I find your presentation persuasive that the vote component must be connected with the sound economic component, 
but I find it difficult to know my mind on the subject because whereas your, your presentation sounds sound to me, and how can we guarantee, I guess, is the critical thing that both components will go forward together. But I'm a member of the Anglican Communion, and through the channel of communications that come to me via that, uh, Bishop Tutu and, and the uh, church down there and the Episcopal Church here, such that um, we get the story that it's the request of the church in South Africa, Anglican Church, that wants the sanctions continued because it is the greatest help. And our convention passed a resolution to be sent to our president. Please do not let the sanctions be stopped. Now, what is the communication, therefore, between uh, your government and the church leaders, and to what degree are they thinking soundly about this connecting of the vote with the economic component. Would you comment on that? Yes, let me tell you um, what you're saying about the Anglican Church is absolutely correct. Uh, they, at the present moment, continue to advocate sanctions. Uh, I may tell you that the Catholic bishop, sorry, uh, what I've said is that the, what the gentleman said in respect of the Anglican Church in regard to advocating sanctions is completely correct at this stage. That is still their view. I also wanted to add that the Catholic Bishops' Conference, which took the same view previously, has now changed that view and has said the time has come to remove uh, sanctions. So bear in mind that not all religious leaders have the same view in this matter. But let me tell you that I think that there are reasons why people advocate sanctions. There are two tools available in the negotiating process in order to give advantage in those negotiations. The one is the mass action that I referred to earlier, and the second is the question of sanctions. In other words, in the negotiating process, those two things are sought to be used as bargaining chips. And if you talk to the leadership of a number of the black organizations, not all, they want sanctions because they want to maintain this particular bargaining chip in the process. However, if you look at the opinion polls, the opinion polls conducted by reputable organizations, including some American organizations, they show overwhelming opposition on the part of the black people themselves to sanctions. In other words, they do not want sanctions and do not want them now. And the view have changed in some respects because obviously there was a different political setup before the tax reform started than there was afterwards. So that the opposition to sanctions continue is even stronger now than it was before de Klerk took, that, <coughs> took those steps. And the reason is that the process is actually irreversible. Uh, nobody can stop it. It doesn't matter whether de Klerk wants it or even if by some accident of uh, fate the Conservative Party in South Africa got into power and tried to stop it. Nobody can stop this process. It's, it's got its own momentum. It's got a historical inevitability. And that is why people now believe they are no longer required to make any sacrifices. They have been told by people that sanctions will fall, will cause the white government to change, and therefore you must make sacrifices. If that argument is correct, if the, the question was directed to me whether it did persuade them or not, I don't think it did. But if it did, if it was correct, and I'm wrong in this, then in any case the situation has changed and it's no longer required. So you have at the present moment a difference between the leadership and an understandable difference because they want it in this bargaining process and between the people themselves who don't want it. And strangely enough, I must tell you that the opinion polls demonstrate not only is there support for the concept that there should be no sanctions amongst the unemployed, but the ratio of support is the same amongst the employed. And it's virtually the same at all different age levels. So it varies slightly, but it's, it's the same trend. So you have an overwhelming situation of the people who don't want sanctions to continue, 
And on the other hand, you have leadership who has a reason for doing it. But let me tell you, there is a far more important issue than the question of sanctions in the United States. And that is that at the present moment, we are getting people who, who are investing in South Africa. The people are coming from Japan, they're coming from Taiwan, they're coming from Singapore, they're coming from the Far East, they're coming from Europe. And there will be investment in South Africa. But you see, and I, I tried to say that earlier today, that investment is directed solely from a point of view of coming there in the main in order to make money out of it. There's no political connection with it. In other words, if they come, for example, from Taiwan, they don't care what our politics are. They don't care whether we have apartheid or whether we don't have apartheid. Those, they, that's not the issue. They want to know where the investment is safe and where they're going to make a profit, and they have no political connection with it. Americans have a different approach. Americans have as a foreign policy a bipartisan approach that there should be democracy throughout the world. They want to encourage it. They want to encourage market mechanisms. And in that respect, I'm a strange ambassador. I don't say don't interfere in my internal affairs. On the contrary, I say influence my internal affairs in order to have a true democracy, in order to in fact have the proper economic system. And that will come with investments from the United States when they come. And one last thing which I think is important. The most important sanction which is imposed upon South Africa is not imposed by the United States or anybody else. It's imposed by the South African people themselves. Because until such time as we show to the world that in fact we've got a constitution, we are a democracy, there is stability, there is certainty, then in fact people don't invest. So it doesn't matter whether you lift sanctions. The businessman looks at a country and he says, is that a safe place for me to go? Do I know where they're going? So what we've got to do is we've got to get stuck in and get the negotiations dealt with. We've got to get a new constitution. We've got to go on the right economic road. And then the people from America will come. And that's the real issue. It's not your sanctions. It's the sanctions we impose on ourselves with uncertainty and with the methods, that, with the problems I've just pointed out to you. Yes, ma'am, on the left. Yes, Ambassador, I'd like to welcome you to Baltimore. And uh, I would like to know how long is it going to take? Because the OAU, the Organization, Organization for African Unity, has stated that South Africa is holding up the whole of Africa. People are starving, dying, and the underlying objective might be to decrease the black population. So, Ambassador, how long do you think it will take before two dogs are fighting and the other dog is running away with the bone? Uh, while the black and the white are fighting, your, your, uh, your, Europe, your Oriental and your Asian community is coming in and reaping a lot of the profit, as you said yourself. So how long is this going to take before the black and white get their heads together in Africa, in South Africa? Well, let me tell you, um, uh, I, by the way, just to... to get the thing absolutely clear. Uh, I got no problem with uh, Asiatics in South Africa investing or otherwise. I merely tried to demonstrate. I said I've got no problem with Asiatics or anybody else investing in South Africa. Uh, I'm not a racist. I'm a non-racist person. All I tried to demonstrate was the fact that in your case you have a political interest in it, whereas in the other case it's purely a business interest. The other people do not have the kind of political interest that Americans have when they do invest. That is the point I'm trying to make. I think you've asked a very important question because the future of South Africa, once it becomes a democratic country, and once the politics is out of the way, is very important for Africa as a whole because we can provide the impetus, because I outlined earlier the kind of sophistication that we have and the kind of development we have which can be invaluable to the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that Africa has tended to be the neglected continent and we've got to make sure that in fact it is built up and that's why I talked about the export of raw materials, the beneficiation, all these things. And you then ask the question very pertinently and very correctly, how long is it all going to take? Now, I can't guarantee you anything, but I can give you some facts. 
as I know them. Number one, I believe that everybody is ready to start the negotiating process in South Africa now. And I think there's a prospect, a very real prospect, that that process will start before the end of this year. In other words, people will actually get together at a multi-party conference and will start the whole process this year. So I'm hopeful that in fact things will happen very quickly from now on. And that is why I must tell you I'm fe I was fearful of the strike because I thought that might be something which could derail the process. Because let's be fair, there are people in South Africa on the extreme right and on the extreme left who want to derail this process. They want to derail it. They don't want it to work. They don't want the people to get together. They don't want to find a solution to it. They have different agendas, both on the extreme right and the extreme left. And you all have to do is to look at the pictures of what's happened in South Africa with some of the violence, and you can see the whole thing in a clear perspective that they don't want the process to work. And therefore, I was pleased that the strike came off without undue violence. Now, you may say to me immediately, but 19 people got killed. And I agree with you, that's pretty terrible. And I think every human life is valuable. But when you look at the possibilities of what could have happened, it actually could have been so much worse. And therefore, I was happy because we're so close to a negotiating process that the strike went by with a minimum loss of life even though every life is a very valuable thing. The second thing in relation to time is there is an outside time limit for a new constitution. And the outside time limit, we are now at the end of 1991, the outside time limit is the end of 1994. And that is because the president has said, that's our president, has said there will never be another election under this constitution there will never be another whites-only election in South Africa. He means it, he will carry it out. In other words, that's the outside limit at which this has to be done. So that by then, the new constitution has to be in being. I hope it will be a lot earlier, but I also hope that the constitution will go, as I say, side by side with economic development. Because if you talk to people in South Africa, you will find that they are concerned about the tremendous gaps in wealth, in income, in skills, in opportunity, the issues relating to education and training. There are a dozen things which I can mention to you. So the economics has to go with the politics, but I hope that we will certainly make it long before 1994, but that's the outside date. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, in response to your remarks concerning rights being the major issue as opposed to votes, um, I would contend that in a democratic society, the right to choose those individuals who will represent you is a basic right. And you basically kind of answered my question because I was going to ask, when do you envision that there will be uh, one vote, one person um, in South Africa? But I don't, I don't feel that the right can be taken away from the right to vote, that both of them are synonymous. In response to your remarks about um, giving blacks the right to achieve the right to vote as opposed to giving it to them, would you please clarify for me what is the difference and the process for allowing blacks to achieve the right to vote as opposed to the government affording them the right to vote? But let's deal with the first part first. Uh, I've never, sorry, do you want to repeat the question? I think everyone heard the question. Oh, do you hear the question? Fine. Uh, I've never suggested for one moment, and if uh, anybody understood me in that way, I certainly didn't intend to convey it, that the right to vote should not be included in the rights which people have. All that I tried to say was, and I repeated, that democracy means the right to vote, but it also means other rights which have to be protected. And that is what, to my mind, democracy is. I certainly agree with you when you say that the right to choose who should represent you is an absolutely fundamental right. It's part of what democracy is all about. 
and there's no point in having rights of a different nature, such as, say, the right to assembly or the right to free speech, if you haven't got the right to vote. I'm with you 100%. The distinction between giving and between achieving, I think is very clear. If, in fact, the government were to give the vote to black people, it would give it in terms of a constitution which it would prescribe. Blacks do not want a vote in terms of a constitution which the government is going to prescribe. They want a vote in terms of a constitution which is acceptable to them. And there's a very big difference between exercising a right to vote in one kind of constitution and exercising a right to vote in another kind of constitution. I think we all know that. We can give lots of examples from the extremes of having a right to vote in the Soviet Union which existed, or a right to vote in a one-party state which existed in Africa, or a right to vote in a democratic system such as the United States, or a right to vote in a different kind of constitutional dispensation. You can actually have a right to vote in a constitution which in fact doesn't really give you the true right that you want. And that's why black people in South Africa will want, and I know they want, a participation in the forming of the constitution within which they will exercise the right to vote. And many black people, and many black people in South Africa say, we don't want anything given to us, it's our right. It's not for you to hand it to us. You're not doing an act of charity to give us the vote. In fact, the attitude is, it's our right which we rightfully demand. And I must tell you, I happen to agree with that. I don't think it's for me, as a white in South Africa, to say to somebody, I will be gracious enough to give you a vote. I think that would be an impertinence on my part. I do agree with you in that aspect. However, what is the process that is in place for both, both sides to sit down to identify that so that that can happen in a timely fashion? The, the process that uh, is going to take place, and which I hope will commence relatively soon, is the concept which is accepted as the initial stage by everybody, and that is the multi-party conference, namely that people representing all political opinions will get together, will formulate a method of how the whole thing is to be evolved so that everybody is represented at a meeting where votes will not be taken but where you will seek to achieve a consensus as to how you're going to go about doing it. In other words, it will start in an unstructured manner with every person who is representing any meaningful section of the population having a say and participating and seeking to achieve a modus operandi as to how to deal with this. That's the initial step and everybody has agreed. The ANC wants a multi-party conference, the government wants a multi-party conference, my party, the Democratic Party, wants a multi-party conference. There are some people who do not want it. There are some people who say, all we want is a transference of power. And I must tell you, and I, I want to be very frank with you, I don't like, and I never liked, and I opposed it for 40 years, the prison system. And I'm not interested in whether the prison system is being applied by a black person or a white person. I don't like the prison system. And I don't think the majority of people like the prison system. So merely to transfer the power under the prison system doesn't solve anything. It actually creates another problem, which I think we want to avoid.